Well, here it is. Volkswagen's first EV for the U.S. market. Not exactly the first to arrive. Behind Ford Fusion Electric, behind the Fiat 500 Electric, behind the Nissan Leaf, and I could go on and on. Let's see what they've added to the stew, if anything, as we drive the 2015 e-Golf and check the deck. Now, spotting an e-Golf is both difficult and easy. First of all, difficult because it's the same body and platform as the regular seventh generation Golf. But here are the details to look for. First of all, LED headlights. VW is first in the US. They're standard on the e-Golf because they're low energy consumption with great light. Also, these wheels are E only. They've got that kind of pie pan design, very flat and right out at the edges of the wheel wells, which helps flow air over the vehicle and again, use less energy to move. And out back, it's really obvious. Just take a look and you'll see no tailpipes. That's when you know you're following an e-golf. Now, if you know a golf, when you get in the e-golf, it's very similar. But the one thing you'll know right away is that things are different on the left side of the instrument panel. You'll see when you're in charge, regenerative charge is the green band. And of course, right now, it'll show that I'm in the off mode. Out on the right side of the gauge, that doesn't show RPM, which is what it would suggest. It shows percentage of total power you're drawing right now. At the bottom is a mini gauge that shows how much total power you're able to draw. As the battery gets lower, that gauge will get lower. And when the battery is very low, you can no longer get total or absolute maximum power. And then on the right, inset in the traditional speedo, is your battery level gauge that replaces a fuel level gauge. Finally, you're typically going to want to put in the very middle here, the range screen. That's the one thing that's missing. It's not a fixed gauge, so I like to put range right in the middle. And now I've got a really great comprehensive look at my energy future. Now, over here on the right, we have a standard 5.8 inch LCD touchscreen, including navigation. The resolution on VW screens remains stunningly crunchy. When you've got really fine dot resolution, things are easier to digest by the eye. When you've got excellent touch response, which we don't necessarily have here, things are easier to control and get your hands and eyes back on driving. This is a serious issue, and this is just not pretty either. A couple of interesting things they have done, however, is you've got a capacitive touchscreen. That means you can do pinch and zoom things, like with the map, for example. But I just find that it's oddly non-responsive and very slow. I'm trying to pinch and zoom that map, and it's just dumb. Notice this. When I pull my hand away, a lot of the toolbar goes away. When I get closer without touching, a proximity sensor brings that up. That's a nice touch. Now, in terms of entertainment sources, boy, this is spread all over the car. Under radio, you've got AM, FM, and HD radio, all standard. Under media, you've got a lot of choices. Optical disc, that lives over in the glove box. Bluetooth streaming is part of pairing your phone, and that's standard. iPod and other connectables are down here in the center console, and they still use this, what they call an MDI, this kind of a pigtail arrangement. Here's one for an old 30-pin Apple device, and I'm currently using one for the new small lightning connector. But the fact that you have to have dedicated specialty cable is a very old idea. Where's my USB jack? Instead, I get nearly useless SD cards I can put in the glove box. No one uses those for media. Now, unlike a lot more expensive cars, this e-Golf gives you rear camera and rear park sensors standard. Oddly, you've got trajectory on the sensor screen, but not trajectory prediction on the camera screen. That's a weird way to split it up. Now, driving the e-Golf gets you a little different set of drive controls. Normal mode is your base. That's your most aggressive. That gets you your fastest 0 to 60 time and uses all horsepower and torque. Eco and then Eco Plus both change the throttle response and reduce the maximum horsepower and torque you can get out of the car. When you get to Eco Plus, this car feels like it took on another 1,000 pounds. The responsiveness becomes very muted. However, you see an immediate jump in your predicted calculated range on the dash as well. The other control is interesting. Go back here to drive, and you've got a B position if you go all the way back. That's a high brake regen position. We'll see how all this works together on the road. Now, under the hood of our e-Golf is, of course, strictly an electric motor. This is not a range extender, a hybrid, a plug-in, straight EV. And there's no transmission to speak of. It's a single speed reduction gear. Now, what we've got going on here primarily is a battery story. 24 kilowatt hour lithium ion, the latest technology. And as you may have noticed, it doesn't really intrude in the back. It doesn't have some big lump in the cargo bay. The battery largely lives under the rear seats and then kind of working its way a little bit forward of there and largely using up the tunnel in the center. They also did not have to equip this car with a separate, elaborate, expensive battery cooling system. The batteries they're using from Panasonic just cool themselves in everyday operation. That's interesting. 
Some numbers, 115 horsepower out of this motor, that doesn't impress anybody, but 199 foot-pounds of torque. Hello electric. Zero to 60 for this 3,400 pound car is about 10.2 seconds. By the way, this electric version weighs approaching 500 pounds more than a Golf 1.8 TSI. 700 pounds of battery is a big part of that, but of course they lost a lot of weight up here in the engine bay. Charging is the usual story on these EVs. If you gotta use a wall outlet, pack a lunch. It's gonna be 20 hours to get a full charge. If you have a 240 outlet, that's something you get installed at your house or drive to somewhere. Now we're down to a more reasonable under four hours for a full charge. Or if you can get to one of those really high current chargers that are rare, you wouldn't have that at your house, you can use additional connectors here to get 80% in 30 minutes. That's basically a Tesla supercharger setup, except you don't get Tesla range out of these. They're rated at 70 to 90 miles on a full charge, like just about every other compact electric car. And the MPGE, which is related but different than range, is 112. Well, the first thing I notice is a very quiet drivetrain. Now, obviously, it's electric, so you don't hear a lot of noise from any of these kind of vehicles. But you do sometimes hear a lot of gnashing and whining of gears and motors that is not pleasant. It feels quick at mid-throttle, but it's not a real barn burner in terms of power, as you can imagine. But it's quick in everyday sort of nibbling and driving, where you actually would use the power band. Secondly, all these kinds of cars have a heavy feel. Uh, it's just a different kind of a suspension bounce than you get in their lighter gas engine cousins, which tends to lead to a very planted ride, but also makes the car feel a little less nimble. Nothing about it is wallowy. It still feels pretty sharp and pretty, uh, pretty sprightly, I guess is the word. And when it's an Eco Plus, the response is really muted. Think ahead before you have to goose it for a lane change or something. A couple interesting notes here. They've got a special roadside assistance program. If you run out of a charge within 100 miles of your home address, they will come free of charge, pick up the vehicle, take it to the nearest charging station, and they will also pay your taxi fare to get home. Okay, let's price and do a reality check on our e-golf. 36.2 with delivery out the door. There's nothing to add to go CNET style. It is what it is. Take off 7,500 for a federal tax credit, and we're here in California, so we'd get another 2,500 off for a full EV like this. Now we're at about 26.2. It's pretty easy math. What's interesting about the e-Golf is that Volkswagen's working off a modular platform here that allows them to plug in an electric powertrain as a pick pretty easily. They didn't take and reverse engineer a gas car like a Fiat 500e, nor did they create a whole new special electric car like a Nissan Leaf. That should give this car, in the world of the bean counters, a little more head Room, a little more breathing room to find a market, but it basically doesn't reinvent the electric car of its category or range.